science explorers. I was just coming back from a bike ride to start our next discovery challenge. Oh, oh I didn't see that curb. Boy, my bike stopped, but it felt like there was a force continuing to move my body forward. Have you ever felt that in a bike or a car? Well, a funny thing is, forces are part of our next discovery challenge. Hopefully you got a chance to watch Billy Joe Deal's video about being a transportation safety coordinator. If not, go to Ghost Stem's YouTube channel and you can watch it there. So Billy Joe is super passionate about her job and I'm super grateful that she is. To explore forces around car crashes, we're gonna create models with toy cars and Play-Doh people. I have books, my paper, a ramp just out of cut out cardboard, my toy car, tape, a marker, one of the thicker diameter ones, some Play-Doh, and my pencil. So in super speed, I'm going to show you how we'll set up our crash models. All right, so you're going to tape down your marker onto the piece of paper somewhere not quite halfway across your first piece of paper and then you're going to tape down your papers and so I've used two here I think that's going to be beneficial and I'm grabbing one book putting my ramp underneath that marker a little bit and I'm going to make my little play-doh person three little balls that I'll make like a snow person that will set on the hood of of the car there we have it we should all be set with our crash models now. I have found that a pretty large person compared to the car, kind of like so, hopefully you can see that, is pretty helpful with this activity. And the whole point of this activity is that with our models, we'll explore why things move forward when we crash. So for crash model number one, we're gonna use this setup and we'll send our car and person down the ramp five times. That's five samples. So, and we'll wanna make sure that we start our car at the same spot every time. So go ahead, you'll wanna make a line on your cardboard or whatever your ramp is so where your starting point is. And you'll send your car and person down and you'll see where your person lands. You'll take your pencil, mark with a line where your person fell, and then you'll label that line with the number one. That number one tells, it, tells us that this is crash model number one, okay? So then, after you've done that five times, for crash model number two, you're gonna change things up. You're going to change your design any way you want using the materials that you have. And again, you'll take five samples. So pretend, let's see, I changed the height. This is my number two. I'll send my person down. Same thing. I mark with a line where my person fell. And I'm going to label it this time with a number two because now we're in crash model number two. All right, your turn. Go to it and enjoy. Now that you have explored the two models, look at your data on the paper. And here is my data. I circled all the marks from model one and I circled all the marks from model two you do the same with your papers. Do you notice any patterns? Are there differences between the two models? Maybe there are similarities. Maybe you have some explanations based on your evidence why the person might fly farther in one model than another. 
Those questions I just asked you are questions you're going to share with everybody else in the Explore Science program on Flipgrid. Can't wait to hear about it. So that concludes this first part of your discovery challenge. Billy Joe Deal has another challenge for you. How much restraining force would be needed to keep you from moving forward in a crash? This is the job of our seatbelts, applying that restraining force to keep you from flying forward in a crash. Think about this, a car traveling at 40 miles an hour, which is, which is pretty slow, really, 40 miles an hour, if they hit a tree, that would be the same amount of force as hitting the ground after falling off of a 50 foot cliff. And a person inside that vehicle who was not wearing a seatbelt would hit the windshield of that car with the same amount of force as hitting the ground after a fall from a five story building. Do we think, do you think that you'd survive that? Do you think that the person to your left and right would survive that? I'm guessing probably not. Are you ready to figure out exactly how much restraining force would be needed to keep you from moving forward in a car traveling 70 miles an hour, which is the speed limit of on the freeway just outside Baker City? I'll give you a hint. It would take almost 11,000 pounds of restraining force to stop me from moving forward in my vehicle traveling at 70 miles per hour. And that's one reason I always wear my seatbelt. But let's take it one more step. After you do that, I challenge you to figure out how much projectile force that this object would have in the same vehicle traveling 70 miles per hour. Many of us have these in our cars right now. We've got water bottles. They're full, they're empty, they're different weights. In a crash, this water bottle would be considered a projectile that would be flying around the car and could cause some serious damage to the people inside. My water bottle weighs 3.7 pounds when it's full of water. Think about the other items that might be in your cars that you ride in. Being able to tie things down or restrain them somehow helps keep everyone safe. Good luck with your activity and the rest of your summer. I hope to see you all again soon. Okay, time out. We still haven't talked about why my body when I hit the curb kept moving forward and why our little Play-Doh people kept moving forward in our models. And also why our bodies and water bottles keep moving forward when we crash. Well, there's actually a phenomenon. It's a scientific law called the law of inertia. The law of inertia says an object in motion will stay in motion unless a force stops it. So are the pieces coming together for you? So it's inertia, the fact that our bodies in motion want to stay in motion that makes us move forward in a crash unless there's a force, a restraining force like our seatbelts that stop us. To be completely clear, seatbelts are the restraining force that stops our body's inertia in a crash. So I have a joke for you. What does a police officer and inertia have in common? Give up? They're both laws that tell us to wear our seat belts. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the calculations. To meet Billy Joe Deal's challenge, we will calculate our seat belt's restraining force. Remember, the restraining force is also known as force of inertia. The restraining force of a seat belt is calculated by multiplying weight times speed. It's really a simplified version of a more complicated equation, but it helps us understand the concept. Let's flip that equation around and say our weight times speed equals our seat belt's restraining force. So in my case, I weigh about 150 pounds. So I would multiply 150 times 70 miles per hour to get 10,500 pounds of restraining force a seatbelt needs to keep me safe in a car. So you can do the same with your own weight. 
or if you rather, you can also measure the projectile force of something like a water bottle you might keep in your car. It's the same equation. Weight times speed equals projectile force. For example, a two pound water bottle at 70 miles per hour would need 140 pounds of restraining force to keep it from flying around in your car during a crash. Okay, science explorers. It's time to share what you've learned. So collect your crash model and restraining force discoveries, and we'll see you on Flipgrid. Until next time, keep exploring.